I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. A lot of people are shooting themselves in the foot repeatedly, and then they end up in the same place over and over, and they don't realize what they're doing. And so I want to hold up a mirror to them and help them see their reflection more clearly so that they can change the things that aren't working out so well for them. In the book, you said that your goal as a therapist or the goal of a therapist is to sort of get the patient to be curious about themselves. Right. Well, most people know what they should do. The question is, why don't they do it? Yeah. And so why don't they do it? Well, the general reason they don't do it is because whatever they're doing protects them. So whatever they're doing is their way of coping with something. It feels more safe to them, even if they're miserable in the safety. That's why change is hard, because people want to stay in the familiar place, because at least they know it, even if it's an unpleasant place. So I always hear stuff like that, like, oh, someone's terrified of a real relationship, or someone's afraid of success, or they're going to self-sabotage. Is that really true? Like, why is someone afraid to be happy in a situation? I'm rolling. James is going to be revealing, but not self-absorbed. I'm going to be both. I'm going to be both. (laughs) Uh, So happy once again to have Lori Gottlieb on with her brand new book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. This is such a great book, Lori. I really enjoyed it so much. Thank you. And let me just describe real quickly what it is. You're a therapist, and it it reminds me of the— and you mentioned the show in the book. It reminds me of the HBO show In Treatment, where Gabriel Byrne's playing a therapist, and you get to see— the ins and outs of all his therapy sessions. But in the meantime, he has his own issues. And if I remember correctly, he's even seeing a therapist. So, but this is real. Like you kind of go in and out of the lives of of many of your patients. And meanwhile, you're going through a rough time in your life uh, uh, and you're seeing a therapist and it's your issues dealing with your therapist plus your issues dealing with all your patients. It's so voyeuristic and there's page turners on each chapter like you know john just walks out and he's about to tell you something but now we don't even know what it is and we don't know if he's ever going to come back because he's upset at you so we we get our it's like it's like um it's like i'm reading a reality show like a good reality show yeah yeah the page turners are there for me too because as a therapist i don't know what's going to happen next and so i really want to take the reader through that experience with me as i lived it you know what's interesting is also it's so different. People, I think people uh, sometimes think, oh, therapy is like a type of self-help. And I really understood reading your book what the difference is between therapy and self-help. And you you kind of underlined it several times without specifically saying it. But you're not prescriptive at all. You're not saying, you know what? You should break up with that guy. Or you know what? This, this y- you know, you should treat your wife better or whatever it is. Uh, you're, you, you say something in the book that's really interesting and really stuck with me, that the patients who get better are the ones 
who are curious about themselves, not just curious, because you always think it's, it's like a self-help thing. Be curious all the time. It's like one of those cliche quotes you see on Instagram. But the be curious about themselves, and, and you as the therapist, you're just trying, not just, but you're, you're basically trying everything you can to trigger that self-curiosity in the patient, it seems. Right, right. Because I think a lot of people come to therapy and they want to change somebody else. Um, and quickly they start to realize that the only person they can change is themselves. And they need to get curious about what their role is in the situation that they're bringing in. So if it's, um, you know, I'm always arguing with my husband. Well, he's doing something, but so are you. So what can you get? Can you get curious about your part in this? So, so is, do you think that it, what, like, how would you define the role of the therapist? Like what, like in that situation, what's your goal? Like, um, mm -hmm. couples coming in or, or let's just say an individual comes in and says, my husband said this, don't you think that's ridiculous? What should I say back? Right. So first of all, my role isn't to validate them and take their position. So when people always say, don't you think this, don't you think, you know, this person in my life is problematic? Um, I, I don't know. I'm only hearing your side of the story. I'm not hearing their side of the story. Um, and so the other part of it is that I don't really give prescriptive advice. Even in my advice column, I don't give prescriptive advice, really. Um, I really want people to see what their patterns are more clearly. A lot of people are shooting themselves in the foot repeatedly, and then they end up in the same place over and over, and they don't realize what they're doing. And so I want to hold up a mirror to them and help them see their reflection more clearly so that they can change the things that aren't working out so well for them. So like, like for instance, um, and I'm not gonna give any spoilers from the book, but like Charlotte in, in mm -hmm. the book, who's one of your patients, and she's repeating this kind of, um, let's say toxic behavior over and over again. But you won't say to her, don't do that. You're going, it's going to end badly. You, you just won't say, it. and you're holding, it's like you're sitting on your hands uh, and you're holding yourself back from saying it. The reason is that even if you tell people, you know, don't go in the basement, <laughs> it's dark down there, um, they will resent you for it. They, people don't want to be told what to do. They think they do. You know, they'll beg you to tell them what to do. But really, people want to have agency over their own lives, and it doesn't help them to make decisions for them. It helps them to show them how they can make better decisions for themselves and then to learn to trust themselves to make better decisions. Yeah, like, um, and again, I'm, I'm going to... I think anyone reading this is going to relate to their own experiences. So before the podcast, we were just talking about an interview you did where the interviewer kept talking about themselves. So I'm going to talk about myself for a second. I was at, this was years ago, I was visiting with a therapist and I was presenting a situation where I thought I was right mm -hmm. and my girlfriend at the time was wrong. And, and I would ask her directly, you know, do you think I should end this? Like I... I feel like I should end this. And she just wouldn't say, <laughs> like, I couldn't get her to say, do you think this is going to work? Or do you think, I and then I would say, well, what should I say back? And even that was hard. She would kind of give some prescriptive answers about what I should stay ba say back. But her goal, I think, was for me to gather data and then figure out what to do with that data. She would even right. use that word data. Right. And And she wanted, she didn't want to have to give her permission to you to do something that you wanted to do. So you kept asking her, you know, should I do this? And then you felt like you would be off the hook almost because I asked my therapist and my therapist said to do this. So therefore it was the right decision. For most of the decisions that we make, there aren't concrete right or wrong decisions. They're just different. And so I think sometimes we expect that the therapist knows exactly what we should do. And partly, we know what we would do in that situation, but we don't know what you should do in that situation. But but let me let me question that, and then and I want to kind of get through other things in the book. But so sometimes when I've been in a let's say a bad situation and I start going to a therapist, I feel like what I'm telling myself is the therapist is like a statistician. So they've seen a thousand examples like mine or similar to mine, and so in those thousand examples, I kind of want to know what on average has happened that's worked out positively for the participants. And, and, and that's almost like mental statistics. Like she's seen what's probably worked given my situation. I don't know. Cause I only know my situation. I haven't seen a thousand situations like it. So I just want to know what has probably worked. So to some extent I'm asking for a prescription based on the statistics of all the examples she's seen, but is that, is that a wrong way to approach it? 
I think she can't really know what's going to happen in your particular situation because every situation is different. We can say in general, if you're unhappy in your relationship, let's look at why. Let's understand how much of it is you, how much of it is her, how much of it is an incompatibility between the two of you. Um, and that will teach you a lot so that even if you don't stay in this relationship, you can take that knowledge to your next relationship. So it's not so easy as to say, well, statistically, <laughs> you know, you'll be unhappy if you stay with this person. You already know, by the way, that you were unhappy with this person. So the question is, why are you unhappy? And can we understand that better? Yeah, I think after that relationship was over, I would say is when she provided the best help, because then my question was, why did I put up with all that I put up with during the relationship? And then we were able to really, then I was really being curious about myself as opposed to just how should I react it, to this statement or to this action or whatever. I was constantly in like reactive mode instead of being curious about myself. So that's why it was such an eye opener when you said that in, um, in, in the book that, the, that your goal as a therapist or the goal of a therapist is to sort of get the patient to be curious about themselves. And I think that's different than self-help where it's like, you know, chapter one, make your bed or chapter two, uh, you know, wake up at the same time every day and there's all this prescriptive stuff. Right. Well, most people know what they should do. The question is, why don't they do it? Yeah, and so why don't they do it? Well, that that's what that's what you have to see. Everybody has their own reasons why they don't do it. The the general reason they don't do it is because whatever they're doing protects them. So whatever they're doing is their way of coping with something. It feels more safe to them even if they're miserable in the safety. That's why change is hard because people want to stay in the familiar place because at least they know it even if it's un an unpleasant place. Um, rather than go off into the uncertainty, which makes them very anxious. And so, so if you were to say, like, let's take the case of Charlotte, who in the beginning, so this is not giving anything, Charlotte is debating dating somebody who is, who you know, who you've seen, and you know this because statistically you've seen a hundred cases like this probably, you know it's probably not going to work out, but you don't tell her that it's probably not going to work out. And what, what's what's your... What's your philosophy then? Like, how do you start to get her to be curious about? Like, can you say to her, hey, list all features you want in a person and list all features that you think might be toxic for you. Um, <laughs> and then and then you could say, now, does this match this? Which matches right. the person more closely, the toxic features or the good features? Could you say anything like that to get them to sort of wake up? Or is even that too prescriptive? Um, no, I mean, you could do something like that. You might, you might say to them, here's what I'm confused about this because here's what you say you're looking for and here are the people you keep dating. So why is it that the people you keep dating don't match up with what you're looking for? And, and is that, do you see like a blind spot? Like, does she say something like, um, well, this next, I've been getting better and this next person looks like he has all the good features I like without the bad, do they have a blind spot so they can't actually see what you're saying? Um, sometimes they do. I mean, we all have blind spots and sometimes they just, they really don't know why what they're doing is so at odds with what they say that they want. So with Charlotte, she keeps hooking up with the wrong guys. She wants a real relationship, but she keeps picking people with whom she's not going to end up having that. And part of that is because without her realizing it, she is terrified of having a real relationship. So the part that keeps her safe is to pick people where it would be impossible. So I always hear stuff like that, like, oh, someone's terrified of a really real relationship or someone's afraid of success or they're going to self-sabotage. Is that really true? Like, are, why is someone afraid to be happy about in a situation? Oh, well, there's a word in the book that I talk about, cherophobia, which is chero is happy and phobia is fear. Um, there are people who are afraid of being happy because for them, happiness growing up was always very dangerous. Um, you know, they grew up in a household where they thought something, they thought things were peaceful in their house and then boom, their father's drinking again or boom, their mother's freaking out again or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I think that they learn that you can't really trust happiness. And so whenever they start to feel a little bit of happiness, it feels very unstable and precarious to them. And so they often will sabotage that happiness so they don't have to sit with that anxiety. And so what are, what are, you know, you, and you mentioned quite a few ways in the book, or what, what do you see as the common ways people sabotage their happiness? Um, they might, well, like Charlotte, you know, they might meet someone that, um, that would be 
the kind of partner that they're looking for and then say like, yeah, no, no chemistry. <laughs> yeah. Right, so you mentioned that specifically in the book. And is there really no chemistry? Like maybe... Well, there really isn't, meaning meaning she she's not aware of this. But once she becomes more aware of her pattern, she probably would be more attracted to people like that. She's, she's inc- like a moth to flame attracted to these guys who are going to treat her badly, right? Um, and so that's what she's attracted to. That's sort of like the the unconscious process. It's it's what we call repetition compulsion. You know what Freud called repetition compulsion. You mentioned that phrase in the book. I, by yeah. the way, I want to interrupt a little. You mentioned so many different. One great thing about the book is that without this being a textbook, in fact, it's a very story driven page turner. You mentioned so many different therapists. It's like a mini history of the the science of of therapy and you mentioned all these different therapists and and you know what makes you know Freud different from Rogers different from so and so uh that it's very interesting like i i learned i simply learned a lot as opposed to just enjoying all the stories as well right i mean what i want to do is i want to show people what therapists think about and how we think about their problems and so i explain a lot of how the mind works, how people are at odds with themselves, the ways that people get in their own ways, the way they self-sabotage. And I explain that in, in you know, regular language so that people understand that going to a therapist isn't like mumbo jumbo. <laughs> you know, it's like, here's, here's how we tick, right? Here's it, what it, makes us tick. It's also not just someone giving, listening and, and giving some wisdom back or giving some advice back. Like you're, you have this all these different studies and theories that you're drawing from. So you, you so you're about to explain, sorry, um, Rogers and and repetition compulsion. Uh. Oh yeah. So I was saying, you know, with people who who keep getting into the same problem over and over with Charlotte, it's repetition compulsion where um, it's like you want it, you keep uh, repeating something, a pattern from childhood. So with her, it was her unavailable dad, right, and her mom who was also sort of unavailable. Um, and she keeps finding other people her in her romantic life for that. And then there's this unconscious wish that this time it'll go differently. This time I can master that situation. This time um, this person, I can get this person to become available to me. Again, completely out of people's awareness. Yeah, I think that's where the blind spot occurs. They think that, uh, oh, I've, boy, I've, I've dealt with a lot and now I'm finally ready. And so they enter into she Charlotte might enter into something thinking that okay this is it's it's kismet we met in the hall uh, you know in the waiting room of the therapist so we're both working on ourselves and this right. is this is a step up from what I've done before which is meeting a guy in a, in a bar say as opposed to a, a guy in a therapist's office so so I think I think how do you over how do you know when you're falling into a blind spot as opposed to Well, I think that's what therapy does, right? Therapy, it it says, hey, I want to show you something that you're not quite seeing. And I think that the ways that we behave, even, you know, the way Charlotte behaves um, is is not that dissimilar from any of the other patients, meaning even, you know, John is very abrasive. He's this Hollywood producer and he's, um, he's got his own way of protecting himself, which is to keep people out. And you have, you know, a woman who's about to turn 70 and her adult children won't talk to her and she's messed up a bunch of her marriages and she doesn't know if anything can change, but she's she's sabotaged herself this whole time because she's tried to keep herself safe by basically isolating herself. And so I think, you know, all the ways that we get in our own ways are there for a reason. It's not because, you know, people don't know better. It's because they're just acting out of self-preservation. Yeah, so it seems like a lot of what you're doing is you see that they're acting out of self-preservation, but if you tell them how to actually preserve themselves, like if you say to John, John, maybe not everyone is an idiot. <laughs> you know, maybe there maybe that makes you an annoying person to call everyone an idiot. He's what would happen then? What if you were to just basically say, "John, you're calling everyone an idiot. Mm-hmm. They're not really idiots." You're kind of seem like you're a jerk by saying all this. Instead, you're kind of keeping it to yourself, all your opinions of John, as he sort of unravels to to you or unveils to you. So you you deliver it by planting seeds, 
Um, if you plant them too early, right, um, they're they're not they're not going to sprout. If you plant them too late, you know you miss the most fertile ground. So it's timing is really important. When is somebody ready to hear it? There's this old joke, you know, how many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? And one, if the light bulb is ready to change. So it's like it's like the person has to be ready. And usually when they come to therapy, they're not quite ready to change. They're kind of thinking about it. Um, they're kind of like something's not right, and that's how they end up there. And then through the process of therapy, you're getting them ready to see something, and then you're getting them ready to change once they can see that thing. And is it hard for you when you see someone who's like so close to a good decision and they're just not making it, and they 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 then go the wrong way again, and you just want to tell them no? Just do it this way. Like, is it hard for My you to- My telling them wouldn't help because they really have to come to that on their own. The most, the most lasting and profound um, truths that we come to are those we arrive at on our own. Meaning I'll guide them there, but they have to come to see it themselves. If they keep making that mistake enough times and end up you know, in pain enough times, at a certain point, they're going to say, oh, right? Because of the work that we're doing in therapy. But why, why would they ever say to you, why didn't you just tell me and I would have avoided this whole... <laughs> but we are telling them from day one. We're, from day one, we are planting those seeds. We're telling them in a way that they will be able to hear us. If I tell them something very early on, first of all, I don't know them well enough, so I need to yeah. make sure that I have enough context to know that what I'm thinking is actually what's happening with them. But if I, if I tell them something too early, um, they're going to get more defensive about it. They're going to feel criticized. They're going to feel judged. Or they're going to feel like, no, that's not me. You don't understand me at all. Um, and then the defense goes up, and then I have an extra wall to get over. Do you feel like you're, you're different in this way in that I think, you know, so I've been, I've seen different therapists over the decades, and I would say most of them, or 90% of them, I don't want to judged by saying they were no good, but I think a lot of them were just kind of self-validating. They were like, oh, well, so-and-so shouldn't treat you this way. And I would just feel good leaving the therapist's office. So I would always look forward to going back the next week because then I'd feel good again. And I realized in retrospect that probably wasn't didn't provide me the best service, but it kept me going back to the therapist. <laughs> well, that's sort of like the difference that I talk about in the book between idiot compassion and wise compassion. And idiot compassion is a lot of what our friends do, but therapists don't tend to do it, which is, um, you know, validating everything that you're saying. So if you say, oh, my boss is a jerk or, you know, my significant other was so mean or, you know, whatever you say, and your your friends will say, yeah, yeah, that was really mean or that was really bad. Um, even if you've been in that situation, say, 10 other times, um, you know, they might think, oh, something's up with James, right? Because he keeps getting in that situation. But they might not say it because they're worried that you will take offense. Or they might think the role of a friend is to... Is to just, right, it's just back you up, right? But a therapist is very skilled at saying, hey, I want you to look at the situation. It sounds a lot like that last situation you were in and those other 10 before. <laughs> and uh, I want you to just look at this and let's see what are the similarities. So how do you think, like what... Like, obviously, you're probably trying different techniques that you've tried with other patients or that you've learned or that you've studied. Uh, like, take John as an example, who's who's always so abrasive and, and even, like, directly insulting to you without mm -hmm. uh, being aware of it, at least initially. I mean, he's just— I, He thinks he, he's funny. Yeah, yeah he, he thinks he's funny, he think, and he thinks you're playing along with it when actually you're— really angry at, at him, it seems. Not not hugely angry, but you're disappointed that you have to put up with this, it, it feels like to me as a, as a reader. Uh, well, I find him, I find him very offensive and frustrating. Yeah. And so what do you, what are the, what are, you're sitting down with him for the first, second, third time. What are the techniques you start to use or how does it, how does it play out in your head in terms of, it's almost like a game, like what move do you make first? Yeah, so whatever patients are doing in the outside world, they will eventually do with the therapist too. John does it immediately. Sometimes it takes people longer because a lot of people are on their best behavior when they first get to a therapist. Right, like you, you, he makes you feel like an idiot. He's calling everyone idiots. And then in the very first session, he says, you know, 
uh, can't, something like he, he says that I'm a nobody. That he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. He came to me specifically because he didn't want to run into any of his Hollywood colleagues in the waiting room. So he specifically chose a nobody, and, <laughs> and, and that would be me. And then you offer a suggestion of something of some sort, and he says, you know, no Sherlock, it's this. Or I'm misquoting, but he calls you Sherlock. Yeah, you know, very constantly, c- kind of implying you too might be an idiot, and he has to figure it out for you. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah. So what what. Do you want to kick him out of the office and say, "Look, we're not right for each other," or do you want to? Uh, what's your What's your first set of techniques that you want to try? I think that the way that people behave tells you a lot about what they're protecting themselves from. So he is pushing me away in a very overt way, and so I want to know why is it so important for him to keep people so far away from him. So I don't take it personally. I find it incredibly annoying. But I, I don't take it personally. I, I take it as, again, data, right? Um, what does this tell me about him? What can I learn about him by the way that he moves about the world? So then we're, we're completely skipping the other important part of this book, which is that you um, have a breakup with a boyfriend that you thought you were going to get married to. Do you think the breakup in the breakup he was being unreasonable? Again, I'm not giving anything away. This is in the first couple chapters. And you start seeing a therapist expecting validation. So, so like, yes, of course, he must have been a narcissist or something. And why do you think you think when you're going to your therapist that somehow you're different from other patients and that even though you're at, kind of acting the same as a typical patient, you're sort of expecting a different result? <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, I think it's hard to see ourselves clearly. And I think in the heat of the moment when this unexpected breakup happens, um, and he breaks up with me. This isn't really giving anything away because it happens at the beginning of the book. He, I have an, at the time in the book, I have an eight-year-old, and he says, I just don't want to live with a kid under my roof for the next 10 years. And it's not as though I had been hiding my eight-year-old in the closet, right? <laughs> um, he had been there every day. And so, um, you know, it, it, I, well, I'm sure that this is all about the boyfriend, right? And so I go to the therapist, and really what I wanted from the therapist was what a lot of people want, which is I want him to back me up. I want him to say, no, you're not crazy. You dodged a bullet there. Um, but that's not what he does. And um, I think I'm just there kind of for crisis management and validation. But what I learned is that, and you can see in the book, that what I'm going to therapy for turns out to have very little to do with the boyfriend and much more to do with several other things that are going on in my life. Yeah, and so, uh, but there's still the boyfriend aspect. That it's You call it the presenting problem. It's the problem that you bring initially bring to the therapist. I mean, he did know you had a boy uh, and maybe at some point, whatever, we don't, you never really know the reasons why someone breaks up with somebody. That's the reason he gave you, mm-hmm. which was a good reason for him but it might not be the real reason. And so uh, at the very least, the therapist could say, well, that's a really bad reason given that you're right, you weren't hiding. There could have been some validation there. You were right. It wasn't like you were hiding the, your boy, your your son. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it does seem irrational for him to, to break up for that reason, but your therapist wouldn't say that. Um, you know, I, I think that my therapist didn't happen to say that, but I think that some therapists would, but that doesn't mean that that's the whole story. It means that the therapist just wants you to feel understood. And on the surface, yes, that sounds really, uh, you know, like a, like a big, uh, you know, wrench in, in, the, in your plans. Um, and it's, it's surprising and it's shocking. Um, so a therapist might say something like that, but that doesn't mean that they're saying this was all about him. They're saying, yes, I understand that right now for your, your experience is that it's really shocking. That makes sense. But what if it really was all about the boyfriend? Like what if... You were all happy with this boyfriend. He he didn't let on at all prior to this day. You were getting ready to be married to him. Your son loved him. He seemed to love your son, or maybe he really did love your son. And you really were in grief and crisis and just needed help out of that. Like, why does there have to be a... Like, you kind of mentioned does, there that there right. always is a bigger problem. There, there often is. The presenting problem is often a red herring. It's often a symptom of something bigger that's going on underneath. So I always like to say that I like to listen for the music under the lyrics. The lyrics is, my boyfriend is a schmuck and he just broke up with me and can you believe this? And the music under that is, how did this woman, who seems pretty, you know, functional in other areas of her life, not realize this? 
You know, how, how is that? And well, maybe that would be he was, very suspect. Uh, maybe he was just a— uh, Unless he was a sociopath, which yeah. he probably wasn't. Most people aren't. So I think that the therapist had that in mind. So so he so he so he goes in there thinking, okay, let's see what happens. Let's see what she keeps saying and see what bigger problem might result through through talk. He was listening for the music and the music that he that for him was when I said this thing about and now half my life is over and I wasted 2 years with this person in the in my 40s and I don't have time for that in my 40s and um and he really picked up on that that phrase half my life is over. And it was something that, you know, he said, I think you're grieving something bigger than the breakup. And I thought, well, what are you smoking, right? Like I come to a therapist for help with this breakup and no, the rest of my life is fine. Thank you very much. Nothing to see here, folks. And there was a lot to see there. But even, you know, there are lots of secrets that I think we keep. Um, we keep secrets from the world. We keep secrets from people close to us. We keep secrets from our therapists, but we also keep secrets from ourselves. And I think those are the ones that the therapists really work hard to uncover because I was keeping secrets not only from my therapist, but partly from myself about things that I didn't want to look at, that I could distract myself from while I was in this really fun relationship with my boyfriend. Like, yeah, you start to unravel like um, the, the secrets you were keeping from the therapist. Um, and then, of course, he starts to get into the, the secrets you were keeping from yourself. Yep. And, and you see also how, you know, you kind of had to deal with this similar parallels with you and all your patients. And I don't know, it feels like even though it's very different from self-help, which is very prescriptive, there is this idea of like, okay, for each person, how do we be hearing this or reading your book? It makes me think, well, am I curious enough about myself and my issues? Like when I'm upset at somebody, what might be the other reasons if it's not their fault? Like I think there is kind of prescriptive stuff that you can that you can take away, but more from a therapeutic side than a self help side, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think it's again about noticing what you're doing. We don't notice a lot what we're doing. We're not very aware of it sometimes. We don't even realize sort of what the voices in our heads are saying when we're you know when we're just sort of thinking quietly to ourselves. Um, a lot of what happens in therapy is that. I notice a lot that people are so unkind to themselves and the voices in their heads are holding them back. So if you're in a relationship, a voice might be saying, you know, I'm unlovable. And so you desperately don't want the other person to leave. Or it might say, you know, something is dangerous and you stay away from that. Or it might say, you know, oh, you're an idiot. You screwed this up again. Or, I, you know, or I'm not worthy. Or, um, you know, there are all kinds of ways that we talk to ourselves that we would never say to a friend or someone that we cared about. But like, if so, it, like in the case of, you know, use the example of uh, Charlotte maybe feeling unsafe in stable relationships because when she had an opportunity to be happy as a little kid, it was unstable because of her parents. It would parents. always go away. Yeah, yeah. it would and never so, last. But if so, if something's like built into you for for forty years, say, is it is it really possible to change? Like, you know, I can't really change my accent. I'm not going to suddenly start talking in a British accent. Like, is that is this sort of the same thing? But like an emotional accent and an emotional leaning. Like, it, you're always going to be blind to it. It seems. I don't think I have an accent, and yet I do. Right. I, I don't think so. I think people change all the time. There's a there's a woman in the book that I write about who's about to turn 70, and she gives herself one year to turn things around or else she wants to kill herself. I mean, she's, you know, in a major depression, and she's been depressed most of her life. And a lot of things change for her because, again, she's 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 ready. She's at this point where it's either I'm going to turn things around or I'm not going to live anymore. And so, yes, people can change these patterns. And we always say insight is the booby prize of therapy, that you can have all the insight in the world, but if you don't make changes out in the world, it's useless. Um, I think that when people are ready to change, they use the insight from therapy to make changes during the week. They don't just come every week to therapy and say, here, therapist, you deal with my problems. They're actively working on making changes. When you're seeing these patients and you're thinking to yourself, okay, what's the bigger problem? How do I get them to be curious about themselves? What if they say specifically, you know, my boss said this, how should I respond to that? 
What would, what would you do? You know, it's the same thing when you have a kid and your kid comes home and says, like, this thing happened at, at school today at lunch. Um, your kid has some good answers and you want them to figure it out. So if they say, what should I do? Um, you know, you might say, well, what, you know, what are some ideas that you have? And your kid will have some ideas just like your patient will have some ideas. Well, I could say this. It might be something that you think, oh, that's a terrible idea, right? Um, and you say, well, okay, let's let's talk about all the ideas. And what do you think will happen if you do this? So you help them anticipate the consequences of their actions. Mm. So you don't just tell them the, uh, the consequences. You kind of have them tell you. But they know. See, people know so much more than I think you're giving them credit for. That people know a lot. It's just that sometimes they don't trust themselves at all because they learned growing up or whatever experiences they had in their lives um, taught them that they don't make good decisions. And that's because their barometer is off, their compass is off. But once people can really access their feelings, people try to pretend, you know, I'm not anxious or I'm not angry or I'm not sad. Those feelings are like a compass. You want to use them to guide you to what you want. And so if you're angry at someone, okay, that tells you that something's not working out here. What is it? And now you can examine it. Um, and so people have a lot of answers. If you say, you know, what should I do in this situation? What should I reply to this person? Tell me what you think you might say in that situation. And then we'll say, okay, and how do you think that the other that will land on the other person? And they'll start revising it and revising it. And then they come to something that is a really good solution. You know, and you bring up uh, parenting. Uh, you know, here's where I think the, the, the statistician, you know, model might, might work a little more. Like, let's say your kid, male or female, is a teenager and starts asking the parent about birth control. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say a parent has only dealt with this this one time, but you've seen a thousand parents deal with this conversation. Is that something where you can be a little more prescriptive? Well, here's what people typically say when kids start asking about that. Um, you you can. I think most people come to therapy to deal with kind of messier emotional things and not something so clear as how do I talk to my kid about sex or birth control? Um, it'll come up and I think we can have a more concrete conversation around their particular kid and their relationship with their kid and how um, a conversation might go that's tailored toward that kid and that relationship. But again, you help them to figure out what they would say and you mm. guide them. Mm. And you know, again, throughout all of this, you're learning about yourself by not only going to your therapist, but also you consult with other therapists about your, I guess you have like a group mm -hmm. where you meet up and you exchange notes on your therapist, on your patients and what you should do. So there is like kind of, um, you know, it's funny. There was a, I was interviewing this one guy, Frank Shamrock, who was a, a, an MMA champion, a mixed martial arts champion. And he talked about this concept of plus minus equal. So to learn something, find a plus who you can learn from like a mentor, mm -hmm find your equals who you can trade notes with and who you can move up with and compete with each other. Not compete, but like in a friendly way, like you're sort of at the same spot so you're able to compare notes. And then a minus, people you're helping because that shows you where you are in your learning process. Right. And it's almost the same thing about what you're saying. You had a, a plus, an equals, and a minus. Right. That's interesting because in medical school where I was before I did the therapy thing, um, I there was a saying, see one, do one, teach one right? So you see someone say, put in an IV, and then you do one yourself, and then you teach one to someone who's learning, mm. which is, I guess, the equivalent of the minus in, yeah. in this case. Yeah. So so what through this whole process, you know, you're seeing your therapist, you're seeing all these patients, but then there's this process of you writing the book about it. How do you think you evolved or learned as a therapist? Like, how do you think you got better? Yeah. Um, I think that the experience of being a patient helps you get better, partly because you're learning more about yourself. And so you're, you become a more evolved person and you understand more about your reactions to your patients. And you also understand more about your reactions to people in your life. And so when other people come in talking about the people in their lives, you have a different perspective on it. Um, but I think also... Watching another therapist work is really helpful. So we don't really get to do that very much, um, particularly as the patient. So Wendell, the therapist that I go to, has ex an extremely different style from mine. He's also much more experienced than I am. And he, um, he brings a lot of his personality into the room. 
and he's kind of quirky, and sometimes he's a little bit, um, you know, I, I would say he does things that are unconventional in a way that I wasn't brave enough to do myself. And he doesn't do them gratuitously. They're very intentional. And they're all in the service of getting me to see something in a much more powerful way than I would if he just, you know, said it in in a sentence. Like uh, in the in the dancing scene when he's asking about dancing, what does he think? What do you think he's trying to get you to realize? That I'm that I I often feel like I'm trapped in situations that I'm not. Um, that I felt like I couldn't dance at at that my friend's wedding because I was having these health problems, and he was saying, "Well, you still could, and you could get some help with that." And I think in the same way that he brings up the cartoon of this prisoner shaking the bars desperately trying to get out, and he says, "You know, on the right and the left, the bars are open," and he said, "You know, you remind me of that cartoon," and he, he says it in a kind way, but that a lot of times I was presenting issues in my life as if well, that's just the way it is, and there's nothing I can do about it. And he's saying, well, a lot of us feel trapped by our fears, our pasts, our our external circumstances, our childhoods, whatever, and that you can, you're free now. You don't realize that you're free. And a lot of people don't want to be free. They'd rather sort of stay there shaking the bars because with freedom comes responsibility. And a lot of us are very afraid of taking responsibility for our lives. And uh, did I read correctly? You're pitching this as a show, or it's going to be a show? It's actually um, it's in development for a TV show with Eva Longoria's company. Oh, okay, and yeah. and so you think it all like it's like uh, are, are episodes being filmed right now, or what's happening? We're getting the script written. Oh, excellent. Yeah, and I hope what it does as a show is I think a lot of times in TV and film, therapists are portrayed as what might have been cliches a long time ago and so they persist you know the very cold distant therapist or the or the the train wreck you know the hot mess therapist mm. and you know the therapists that i know are neither so i hope that this show is about just a woman who happens to be a therapist instead of a show about a therapist and then secondarily she's a person right kind of like the in treatment where well, I think in treatment was very dramatic. I mean, it was a great show, but it was it was it was very unrealistic in the sense of you know most therapists are not living these uh, kind of soap operatic lives. Um, so I hope that this show is is much more realistic. I think more in the vein of This Is Us, right? Where I, I don't know that one. It's it's a show on NBC, and it's I really like it because I think it's it's about a family, but it, it shows all of the different character stories are interwoven in the way that in maybe you should talk to someone. All of the different character stories are interwoven with mine, and I think it's really interesting to follow lots of different people's lives and then also see that they're eerily similar. So, was anybody upset with you? Did you get? Did you have to get permission? Hey, I'm going to write. Yeah. Okay, so you got permission, yeah. and I'm assuming you changed names. Maybe you changed some details. Right, right. So, you know, I think that most people who come to see me know that I was a writer long before I was a therapist. And I think that they've seen how I've treated my patients when I have written about them. And it's always, there's a point to it. There's a reason that I'm writing about them. And I think that people um, who come to see me are comfortable with the fact that I've treated those people in a very respectful way. And I've also been very, very careful about confidentiality. Well, again, I think this is a great book to have insight into the mind of a therapist and how they think and how they go about, you know, solving, you know, uncovering and then helping their patients solve their problems. I think also it was a great insight into seeing how a therapist deals with therapy. Also, I think it was great just to learn about all these different styles of therapy and you, know, you explain them so well rather than having a whole textbook or having to read like 50 books to kind of get, you know, the understanding that you explain in here. So overall, I think this is it's just an amazing book to read. I'm so glad you came on the podcast, Lori Gottlieb. Maybe you should talk to someone. Let me ask you one more question. What about, I know you're making a TV show on it, like a scripted show. What about a reality show where it's just like reenactments of like every possible therapy situation? <laughs> <laughs> and how, and then you ask like a team of therapists how they would deal with each situation. Um, you could pitch that, I guess. I think, you know, it's funny when you're talking about what the book is, I think that so much of why I wrote the book is about letting people, it's almost like a therapy session for people who are not necessarily going to go to therapy. Um, I, I think that people will see aspects of themselves in each of the patients that I write about and that maybe they'll learn something about themselves, even if they're not planning on going to therapy. I think that's absolutely true. And I really think, you know, 
patients improve who are curious about themselves. There's always a bigger problem or almost always a bigger problem. And then there's various pieces of, I'll call it advice like that throughout this that made me think, oh, this is making my life better. And if you had just written that, like a chapter called be curious about yourself and then quoted scientific studies, that would not have worked. What's great is the voyeurism. I get to actually see into all these people's lives through your eyes. And that makes the book a, a story. It's a, it really was a, a page turn. I couldn't put it down. So great book. Maybe you should talk to somebody. Lori Gottlieb, you also write the Dear Therapist column at The Atlantic, so people should Google that and, and read it. Look, the columns are always great. You've come on the podcast before to talk about that. Thanks so much again for coming on the podcast. Come Thanks back Thanks so much. Anytime. I always enjoy it. Excellent. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.